Oh, God, good, you're here. I am so excited. Guess what? Uh, I hope this isn't about your podcast again. Why? Did you finally listen to it? Da 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 The Gloomy Next Door Production. The 1970s and 80s had elbow, gravy train, perina, meow mix, and bell bottoms. You've changed your clothes, now change how you feed your pet. Like bell bottoms, kick the kibble and join us in the 21st century with the healthiest diet for dogs and cats. Feed naturally, feed raw, feed fetching foods. Hello, pups and kittens, and welcome to another fun-filled and informative episode of the Groomer Next Door podcast. I'm your host, Chris Green, and joining us this week is Laura Moss. She's written a book about adventure cats and has a great deal of information about it, and for that reason, I am looking so forward to sitting down and talking with her. But before we actually get into that, let's dive into the fact of the week. Pit bulls have been given a bad rap. Bad Rap, B-A-D-R-A-P, was started in San Francisco Bay Area on behalf of pit bulls and their people, and was ranked nationally as the number one high-impact nonprofit for animal welfare. So cool. Alright, by that sound, Laura is about to enter the podcast studio. So with that said, welcome Laura Moss from Adventure Cats. Oh, hello. Hold on a sec. Dad, we have a guest on the podcast. All right. This week on the podcast, we are joined by a very interesting lady with a very interesting story. Thanks to Troy Allison, who actually brought this to my attention, we are joined by Laura Moss of Adventure Cats. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. And, you know, you know, it's, it's really a cool concept, and I'm just dying to hear all about it and you know what before we even dive into the origin story of adventure cats you also have a very interesting story and how you actually got to this plateau and this path that you're on so let's start with your origin story so we get to know you a little bit better okay um well i guess i've always been an animal lover and a cat lover And the first time I ever encountered um, somebody actually walking a cat on a leash was when I was volunteering with a rescue in college. And after I cleaned all of the the cages, um, my manager asked if I would walk one of the cats around the PetSmart where we were on a leash. And I thought it was just the strangest thing. Um, And we had that one experience and everybody saw the cat walking around the aisles and he got adopted so quickly because people were just fascinated by this leash trained cat. So that was kind of my first um foray into adventuring it with a cat and uh since then i mean i've been volunteering with rescues and i've been working in journalism and i kind of found my niche working in um the writing about pets and so a few years ago i talked to quite a few people who were making headlines for taking their cats climbing or camping or backpacking and um, like stephen simmons with his cat Burma the adventure cat and how Burma has this great story of how he's helped Stephen overcome PTSD. And uh, I think uh, Craig Armstrong with Millie the Climbing Cat out in Salt Lake City. And I just thought it was so interesting that people could go from, you know, taking a cat, walking through a home or a pet store on a leash to actually going out on these big adventures. And I was curious about how you go from point A to point B. So I started doing research and talking to people. And in that research with um, cat owners and veterinarians and behaviorists, I discovered this whole community of people um, who were taking their cats out on leashes and giving them these safe ways to explore the great outdoors. Very interesting. Um, you know, it's funny because 10 years plus, because my daughter wasn't even born, my, my wife and I, we both had bunnies. And we did the same thing. We put, uh, it was ferret leashes, ferret kind of uh, harnesses on them and we would take them out and we'd go to Starbucks and they would just kind of bounce around. <laughs> and, and we thought the same thing. We're like, you know, it would be so cool if one day we have a cat and we put a harness. And again, it, at that time, the only idea was a ferret harness because it would actually fit kind of appropriate. 
And yet we never was able to do it. And I'm thinking to myself, gosh, it would be so cool to be able to take, like, especially our Oliver, who's a Maine Coon, take him out for a walk. That would be so much fun. But, you know, again, I'm not really knowledgeable in this. So that's what makes your story and your information so beneficial to us. So tell us the origin story of Adventure Cats, please. Um, so I had been working as a pet writer for several years and had gotten to know some of these cat owners who were taking their cats outdoors. And I told my husband one night that I wished there was a resource that could kind of teach you how to take your, you know, take your cat outdoors in a safe way. Um, I know there's, you know, so much research about how outdoor cats don't live as long as indoor cats, you know, because they're more exposed to traffic and disease and wildlife. But I, you know, I know that cats are these very wild beings. They're not domesticated in the same sense that dogs are. And I know my own cats love to watch cat TV and look out the window and watch the birds. And, you know, they, they've done some door dashing in their time. So I was wondering if, you know, leashing my own cats would ever be an option. So that I told my husband one night how I wish there was that resource. And he was like, well, you're a writer and I can make you a website, but we could make that. And I was like, okay, I guess we'll give that a shot. And so I never actually envisioned it being um, what it is today with the following that we have. But I, we just wanted to to provide this information. And while we were working on that in 2015, uh, PetSmart Charities came out with a survey that I thought was so interesting that basically said something like 49% of Americans find these negative stereotypes about cat people, that there's crazy cat ladies or cats are aloof or that there's not enough adoptable cats in shelters. And in reality, more cats are euthanized annually in U.S. shelters than dogs. And there are these animals that can make a great pet, you know, both indoors and out. And so I was wondering if maybe adventure cats could kind of rebrand cats and change people's idea of what cat people are like. Because, yeah, you might have somebody who, who fits this, you know, outdated idea of a crazy cat lady. But, I mean, there are, there are men who love cats. There are women who love cats. There are outdoor people who love cats. So I was really hopeful that if we could show cats and cat people in different lights, that it could change people's minds and lead to more adoptions. You know, it's funny because in, in all the time I've been doing this, cats tend to not register as high on, on downloads as I would think. Because you would almost think that more people have cats than dogs just because, you know, the way of life and the fact that cats are so, so self-sufficient. And yet people are almost kind of like, eh, cats are kind of like goldfish. And yet to me, I love my cats. My cats are, are just as, as active and playful and crazy as my dogs. And so to think about taking my dog and my cat out, it just fits. 100% of, of my needs. The other thing I've noticed yeah, is, I, yeah, go ahead. Oh, I, I think that so often people tell me like, oh, your cats are different. Your cats have such personality. And it makes me crazy because I'm like, every cat has personality. It's just right. are you engaging with your pet? Are you playing with them? Because you can bring that out and, you know, develop this relationship. It's not just my cats. It's every cat has a unique personality just as every person does. I completely agree. I mean, when I get up in the morning, and it's, it's, I'm the first one up. My daughter is the second one up. And our cats are just, they run and jump on, like my Maine Coon jumps right on my shoulder, wants to ride around as I'm getting everything ready. And mm-hmm. the, a, a couple of the other ones are always with my daughter or it's, it's, our cats have so, so much personality and love. And I'm thinking, what are you talking about? Cats don't just sit in the window all day or sleep. I mean, when we're around, our cats are always next to us. So why not go out with them? Right. And I think um, there's a, a veterinarian in Atlanta that um, you, you may want to talk to one day. Her name is Lynn Barr. And she's fascinating to me because she ended up leaving veterinary medicine to start a company called Desi and Rue because she felt like she's been doing a disservice to cat owners because she's been telling them, keep your cats indoors. And in areas like Atlanta, where I live, it's very it's very warm in the summer, especially. So, you know, you're keeping cats inside and the windows are closed. And it started to, I guess, made her feel guilty about these animals who are trapped indoors and who aren't getting um, the activity or the mental stimulation that they need. So she started a toy company that kind of encourages cats to, to play and to hunt and pounce. And we've been talking about ways, that, you know, to show people that you can 
find a safe way to get your cat outside. It's open to have sunshine, even if it's in a catio or a stroller. And I just think it's such a great idea because I think that, you know, we are seeing more cats who are having, you know, behavior related, um, born related behavioral disorders or obesity. And taking your cat outdoors isn't the only way to, to keep them active and healthy, but it's an alternative. Mm-hmm. It is. And there's, there's multiple ways of having catios. That's one thing that I, I've really been in join seeing all the renditions of it if you look at some of these people that have actually kind of made french windows that are actually catios so that maybe they don't have a front front uh, front porch or a back porch but their window kind of you know can work out just the same there's so many ways and it's so cool and it's one way of reducing your cat stress because let's be realistic cat stress out over everything So, are there a specific breed that makes better adventure cats that actually can go out, or are all cats able to go out at all times like that? Uh, I think it just depends mostly on the cat's personality. Um, I will say that, you know, people I know who have taken their cats outdoors for a a long period of time on leashes, they typically start leash training when the cats are very young. Mm -hmm. I leash trained my cats when they were about four and five years old. And they love to explore the backyard. And I have a little creek in the yard and I have to put their paws in that and like lie in the sun puddles. But they would never be comfortable like going onto a public trail or like encountering other people, other dogs. But you know, there's some cats who have the personality who have been, you know, on a leash since day one that are that are very comfortable and they're they're used to encountering other people and they're used to those noises. So I think it's just a matter of seeing what your cat is up for doing and not push putting them too far out of their outside their comfort zone. Because I think that a lot of people might see some of these gorgeous pictures of people like standing on a cliff with their cats and think that would be so lovely to do. But if your cat's not going to enjoy it, you're not going to enjoy it. And so I think cats will tell you if, if this is for them. <laughs> I like that. If your cat's not going to enjoy it, you won't either. It's so true. That is so true. Yes. <laughs> now, here's the the main thing that I'm wondering is how do you start training a cat to be on a leash? Um, the best thing to do is, um, for mine, since my cats were a bit older, we started very slow, and we would um, just kind of help them to make positive associations with, with the harness and leash. So we would put it by their food bowls or feed them treats on it. And um, so with cats, you know, it's always positive reinforcement. You know, you can't negatively reinforce a cat. You can't punish them. I had a friend tell me once, they're like, oh, I trained my cat not to go on the kitchen counters by spraying her water. I was like, your cat's just going up to throw on the kitchen counters when you're home. <laughs> your cat's just going to want to do. And so, yeah, with cats, you know, take it slow. Baby steps, make it positive, which means lots of delicious food every step of the way. And then once you're, you know, your cat is kind of used to being around the harness, then put it, put it on. And, you know, you don't even necessarily have to snap it on if your cat seems nervous. Just kind of let them get used to the feel of it and give them lots of treats and positive reinforcement. Tell them, you know, what a boy they are. And, you know, as long as your cat's not reacting negatively, you can try adding the um, the leash. And just kind of take it slow like that. If your cat starts to, to react poorly or a lot of cats will kind of freeze up or lay down, and a lot of people think, oh, my cat can't want to take to a harness because of that. I'm like, well, that's a very common thing for cats to do. They're not used to the sensation of having something on their back unless you're someone who dresses your cat up in clothes. So it's going to take them time to get used to it. They will walk a little funny at first. But most cats, I think, can adapt to it. It's just a matter of um, making sure that you're you're taking those steps very slowly and not forcing your cat to do something they're comfortable with. But you want to do all of that indoors before you ever take your cat outside. And when you do go out, I would say, you know, stay very close to home. If you have a backyard or a balcony, that's a good place. And the number one tip I would always tell people is to carry their cats inside. I mean, carry their cats outside. It's because you don't want your cat to learn that, oh, I go outside, I can walk out whenever I want. You want to make sure your cat learns they have to have that home really fun and they always get carried over the threshold, you know, so that they don't become door dashers. Good example, too. That's really smart because I could tell you from experience, a lot of the cats that I, we have, well, actually, no, I take it back. All of the cats except for one is all rescued, and most of them aren't used to going outside. Anytime that they try to go outside, it's a freak out. I mean, you've never seen a cat be more scared of what's out there than these cats. And they've been out before, obviously, before we rescued mm-hmm. them. But they, when they hit out there, they just, it's almost like they touch the ground and it's, what is going on? This is not the living room. This is not the kitty, you know, kitty condo. What is going on? And that, 
Mm-hmm. So it's very smart to actually carry them because then, it, of course, you don't want them dashing and heading out because that that can't be good either. No, no, it's definitely it's one of those things where you know, if you're starting young and the cat's used to a harness, and you know they're so open to experiences as kittens, and so it's not going to be as overwhelming for them. But if you're taking a cat who's been indoors all of its life, you know, that can be a real shock to the system. Mm-hmm. And you know some cats might adopt may adapt that, and others won't. And that's what we always tell people is that it's not for every cat, and your cat will let you know. You know you you know how to tell if your cat is comfortable and how to read their body language and what to watch for. And if your cat is scared, then, you know, bring them back inside, try again another day. And, but don't force the issue because if you try to force your cat to do something he doesn't want to, it's only going to harm your relationship. Right. And don't start training when it's raining or really cool, wet outside. Oh, no, no, yeah. <laughs> you want to have as good conditions as possible. Not too cold, not too warm. You know, you don't want to be out in, like, direct sunlight for long periods of time. You know, just as, if you're, if it's too uncomfortable for you, it's too uncomfortable for your cat. Yeah, that's, you know, it was just a thought process. I was just thinking about that right now. I'm like, oh, my gosh, if it's super hot outside, your cat's going to overheat. If it's super cold or wet, mm-hmm. I mean, we already know most cats don't like anything that's wet texture. So probably not a good idea to start that way because it'll be a traumatized situation. Exactly. So finding and fitting the right harness for your cat, how do you do that? Um, there's a variety of harnesses out there, and I, I personally like the ones that are more like walking bus. Mm-hmm. Um, they just feel sturdier, I would say. Like the Kitty Holster is a great one um, that's made, and you can order it um, um, from the Kitty Holster website or from um, our Adventure Cat site, which is store.adventurecats.org. Um, and a lot of people ended up using dog harnesses just because there's so much more on the market. And so I think it's just a matter of seeing um, what your cat's comfortable in. Like, I have two cats that, you know, we walk around the yard, and one of them has a Tatia dog harness. And we put it on him, it looks great. But my other cat is just, he does not want to put a harness over his head. He, you try to get near him, he'll run away. But we got a kitty holster that kind of Velcros around, um, like, under his stomach. Mm-hmm. And he's very comfortable in it, and he looks very dapper. Um, and so and it just kind of fits him very snugly. So you just want to find something that's a good fit. And the reason why you, you know, start retraining indoors and trying on the harness is, you know, you want to make sure it's something that your cat can't get out of. Because cats are little escape artists. And so you want to make sure that you you have one that fits well while you're inside. And if your cat can back out of it, try a different size, try a different um, type of harness, because there's just so many different things out there. Very good point. Um, especially with the flexibility of a cat, man, they can just, they can contort their body in so many different ways. You're like, boy, I wish I was that limber. That'd be great. <laughs> <laughs> so before you start, now let's move forward. You've found the right harness that fits. Your cat is starting to get used to it. Before you start, before you start hiking, what should your cat have in case of an emergency? Um, you know, make sure that you have, you know, your cat should be microchipped and should have a collar and tags. Um, just in case, you know, if, if the worst happens, you should also have, you know, a recent photo of your cat so you can show people what your cat looks like. But, you know, worst case scenario, but you also want to make sure that you have, if you're going to be going out for a while, that you have food and water for your cat as well. Um, you know, some cats won't be comfortable going to the bathroom in the outdoors, but others won't, you know, if they're not used to that. And so you also want to be able to offer um, litter or a portable litter box or something for your cat. Um, uh, just do everything you can to make sure your cat's as comfortable as possible. And for a lot of people, I mean, your your adventures won't go farther. Like my cats, like to, they love the yard. They like to walk down the sidewalk in my neighborhood, but they don't want to venture farther than that. So we're never far from home. But if cats, there are many cats who go on. You know, they they live uh, in RVs with their owners, or they travel with them. And so for those cases, you know, you need to have um, your cat's medication or the names and locations of vets nearby where you are. And important things like that. Anything your cat would need um, at home, they would also need on the road. Very smart. I mean, for as as somebody who feeds raw, it's it's a little harder if you're going to go on longer walks to have something that that could actually spoil. But it's definitely definitely plausible. So, yeah. I, don't go ahead. I would say and a lot of cats too. Like they they won't. They're not going to eat on the eat on a trail, you know, but, and you don't want them to dehydrate. So something like a, a wet treat or a can of wet food that's real, that's real smelly and delicious might well entice your cat to, to eat that and to, to stay hydrated in that way. 
Right. And that's, you know, that's one of the things that really is something I push the most is that dry kibble. And this is kind of one of the common conversations I have with people in and on this podcast is how dry kibble just dehydrates cats and it's a silent killer. So obviously carrying kibble with you probably a bad idea because it's not going to hydrate them. It's going to continue to dehydrate them. Anything on that that you wanted to topic on? Oh, I don't, I don't know. that's like, I mean, I, I, I think that's like a point. I mean, I think that there's so much debate about the dry food versus wet food and, you know, with, and every vet seems to have a different opinion. Like my, my vet personally says that, you know, that it's better for my cats to be on wet food. So that's what they, they've had since day one. Um, but then there's other people who have fed their cats on dry food for so long that, you know, they have trouble changing their cat's food. And I think that, you know, that can happen when you, you eat, if I eat the same thing every day and suddenly change, I'm sure I would have difficulties too. You know, it's funny because on uh, every one of the rescues that that come in, um, our you know our dogs, our cats are all on wet food and, and raw food, um, and I can't tell you they just it's almost as if it's second nature. I mean, it really is second nature. But they steal bones from from our our dogs, so we have to go and retrieve it, or they'll go after the wet food, and and that's that's kind of the purpose. We want them to be hydrated and, and healthy, but it's funny, I've never really seen a cat come to us that, you know, it's only used to having either what's out in the wild or kibble. And I've never had one that's like, nope, I want kibble, please. Please don't, don't give me this raw food. I mean, it's, it's, it literally triggers their, their second nature, what their, their primal instincts are. So it's kind of funny. So yeah, people, you know, not everyone realizes they have this idea that cats and dogs are so similar, but cats are carnivores. They right. don't need carbohydrates the way that, that we do or that dogs do. And, you know, they, they eat strictly meat and they can taste, you know, meat in a way that we can't, you know, the way mm-hmm. that we can taste sweets and they can't. And I just think there's so many people who think of cats and dogs as being very similar animals when they're actually so different. They are different. And, and that's the thing. It's, they are carnivore. There is no way around that. Um, now we do a, a small kind of puree type of uh, plant base that's inside of our, our cat food just so that it simulates the, in, the stomach of whatever wild animal they would have quote unquote hunted. And that's just, that's just for that, you know, further benefits to their health. But yeah, you, you, you can't really substitute that. That's another thing with, with if you're familiar with plant based diet where people actually have reduced to no, no meat proteins in cat food, um, majority of it's kibble, but you know, there's the debate. Is that plausible? And the answer really is always going to still be no, because they are carnivore. So that's, that's always yeah, a challenge. Right. Like, I'm a vegetarian and that's fine, but I would never put my cats on a vegetarian diet because they're not, they're a carnivore. That's, that's who they are essentially. They need meat to be healthy and happy. I, I, I'm the same way. Um, I don't eat meat. And the reason is, is because I can't stand the practices of commercial farms. And that's, that's right. what really stopped it for me. I mean, last time I went to a fast food place that actually had a burger or something, I was completely grossed out to the concept of, I don't even know what this is. I mean, this could honestly be, you know, slaughterhouse waste put into a patty. I mean, I don't know. And I don't know how this cow was treated. I don't even know if it's, it was a cow. And that's what always scared me. But I know my dogs and cats, they need a meat base. And I, I respect people who are vegan, and I respect other vegetarians. But it's like that whole debate, and I'm sure you've had it, where it's our our dogs and cats. We just cannot get past this. We have to, as pet parents, kind of in a sense swallow our pride and say, "Well, they have to eat this, but we don't." Right, and I think if you're going to bring a pet into your home and you want to give them the best possible life, then you have to do what's best for them. Like, I mean, I have my own personal reasons for not wanting to eat meat, but I can't put those on my cat. You know? yeah. They they are who they are, and they, they instinctively and biologically have meat that I don't. Right. I mean, you know, and everybody has their own reasons, and, and the, there is no reason that's incorrect. It's just we have to understand the science behind all this. And that's the hard, the hardest truth. And I think a lot of people have that, that real disconnect to understand that there is a science behind our dogs, our cats, the anatomy 
of a cat and dog is just so much different and the breakdown. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it's kind of kind of interesting. I always I always like to have those conversations with people. I mean, obviously, nutrition is probably the number one topic on this podcast, but and especially with people that are doing what you're doing. I mean, hiking, long trail walks, they can exert a great deal from the body. So, being able to hydrate and nutritionally feed your cats. That's got to be a challenge. You got to make sure you're keeping your cat healthy while doing this. Right. Um, now, you guys have a book, Adventure Cats Living Nine Lives to the Fullest. How did that come about? And tell us a little bit about it. Uh, well, the book is kind of, it, it's kind of two different kinds of books. It's a how to guide for people who are interested in leashing their cats or even just um, having what we call indoor adventures, which is you know, ways to entice your cat to play or to enhance your indoor environment so that your cat is, is active and healthy and happy. And then we also have um, interspersed with those chapters that are kind of more how-to, we have what we call cat tales. And there are stories of these cats who ha- are out doing amazing things. So we have um, a cat that is unable to, to jump because of a neurological disorder, but she um, was adopted by a family who said they really um, – they related to her because they're they're mountain climbers, and so she has to climb too. And so she's a little crag kitty that goes out with them when they go mountain climbing. And we have stories of a uh, of cats who you know cats that you never hear about cats who love water, but cats who enjoy um, swimming or paddling, and just um, so we have those stories. And then like safety tips, and we talk to lots of vets and behaviorists. And putting together the book was really cool that we get to meet. Like I talked to a veterinarian in Tennessee who takes her cat canoeing and she also runs five caves with her cat in a stroller and it just introduced me to so many people who um have been doing this for so long and it was like adventure cats became a focal point of a community that was already long in existence so yep if you pick up the book it's a, it's a little bit of everything so i think even if you don't ever intend to leash train your cat you could still you know enjoy some armchair travel with by reading about these cats and there's some gorgeous photography of amazing cats doing amazing things yep any any plans on writing another one? Um, not at the moment. <laughs> I, I I write a lot, um, and I'm working on other books that aren't cat related, but um, not currently any more cat books in the works. It's it's always interesting, um, and and the the whole process of talking to you know interesting people like yourself, it you know you experienced it by doing the book. You learn so much from people and you're able to kind of share stories and interact with them and find out how interesting people can really be. And just down to even the mountain climbing, I mean, rock climbing. I, I just think that's so cool to be able to take your cat and, and experience these things with your cat. That's so cool. Yeah, my favorite thing um, in putting and doing some of the interviews with these cat owners is uh, there's a man named Craig Armstrong who takes his cat, Millie, out with him hiking and climbing and backpacking. And he kind of put into words what a lot of people have been telling me is that when you're outdoors with a cat, even if it's in your own backyard or out like in a park, is that it forces you to slow down and look at nature in a different way and to see what your cat is looking at and get down to their level. And Craig called it catting, where he said it's all about you know, putting your cat's interests first and seeing things from their perspective and it makes you see the natural world in an entirely different way. And I just thought that was such a cool thing that he has, a, you know, there's this word for it. And so cause so many people had told me like, oh, I love taking my cat outdoors because it makes me slow down and makes me look at things differently. That sounds so cool. Uh, I, I, I am now so interested in putting a nice harness on my Oliver and taking him out because, man, I just, that would be so much fun. Now, you really have not only, you know, built a great brand and, and it is the most recognizable. Adventure Cats is probably the leading, uh, you know, cat harness going out on ventures with your cat site out there. But then you actually came up with a really cool line. You have shirts, you have products. I mean, you really have literally coined the entire area. And, and market. And I, I got to commend you because it's so cool to see that. So how did that process come about and, and what's next? Uh, it kind of came about my, my husband, when he designed our website, made a very cool logo of a cat. 
on, on, a, on a mountain. And a lot of people were asking if we had stickers or shirts, and we did not have those things. So that's kind of how our birch came about. But we didn't want to just be making a profit for ourselves. So we take a portion of all of our proceeds and we donate to no-kill shelters. And we've been working with Best Friends Animal Society because they seem like a really great fit because they actually have a um, a cat hiking program out at their shelter in Utah where you can take shelter cats out on walks in the desert there. So we donate a portion of our proceeds um, to them. And we have uh, everything from, I guess, like T-shirts and tank tops to cat harnesses. And then we also we acknowledge that not every cat wants to be outdoors or it's going to be comfortable. So we've been really working to build up the idea of indoor adventures as well, just to show people that you can engage with your cat and have these great adventures, even if it's within four walls. So we try to sell products, too, that will, um, like the hide and sneak tunnel, and um, we have this organic catnip that we sell by Tabby Jane, just to show people ways they can enhance their cat's lives indoors as well. So that's kind of how, how we've grown. And uh, I'd say I don't know quite what's next for us. We're just, you know, getting to meet more cat owners, and that's kind of my favorite thing is when we get to travel and meet up with some of these cats that we've only known through social media and hearing their stories. And kind of like you said earlier, like when you meet these interesting people and you hear their stories, and so many of them are involved in animal rescue, that it's been such a cool thing for me. Just last week we were at a, at my local cat cafe in Atlanta called Java Cat, and we met a man um, named Sterling who – he goes by the Trap King, and he his whole idea is um, he's helping community cats, and he's practicing TNR. But he wants to rebrand the idea of what a cat person is like because he wants to get more men involved in rescue. And we started talking. We realized that's kind of like what Adventure Cats is doing, too, is we're just making people rethink what it means to be a cat person, what it means to have a pet cat. So I don't know. I guess what's next for us is just kind of, you know, to keep meeting people and see what opportunities come our way. It's funny when you say that because I've noticed the same thing. Predominantly, people think that cats are only to be a, a, a woman kind of animal, which is so, in a sense, sexist and, and such yeah. a, a bad label because it's like cats can be for anybody. It doesn't have to be a, a male thing, a female thing. A cat doesn't care what gender you are. A cat just cares that you treat it well and love it and really honestly serve it <laughs> and that's you know i can look at all my cats if they they love they love to be you know pampered which cat doesn't what human doesn't but they they <laughs> also right but they also are they're very easy to deal with so i i always kind of i i really kind of enjoy the fact that that cats they don't care they don't care if you're young they don't care if you're old and yet this, this weird label that is attached, it really is one of those narrow-minded things that needs to stop. So right. <laughs> I like that. I, I think it's something that um, when I was talking to uh, his name was Sterling Davis, I had to make sure I look at it right. And um, he's on social media as the, the, tra- the original trap king because he does so much trapping and neutering. But um, one thing he said that really stuck out to me is that uh, he says, I want people to know that you don't lose cool points for having compassion. And so he's very much trying to change the idea that, like, it's not just um, women. It's not just white people. Um, He's like, I want to get men and um, African-American men involved in rescue because I think that that we just need to reach this whole other demographic. And I thought that was really interesting. He's doing a great job. You know, it's 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 funny because I I, I, as as you're telling the story, I'm thinking, you know, that's that's kind of how I feel. I don't understand how gender, race, religion, how it plays into anything. Yet I know it does. And it shocks me to this day. I mean, here we're in 2018, and and yet these are still things that are plaguing the world. Not just not just the U.S., not just Canada, but the world. And it shocks me because it's like sexism is, is huge. And yet you would think that in this day and age it wouldn't be, but it is. Um, you would think that these labels would have gone away by now. They haven't. In some sense, it almost feels like they've magnified, and it, it shocks me. I Cats don't give a, a hoot if you're white, black, blue. They don't care. You know, that's what I love about cats. They're completely colorblind. And they're, <laughs> they're completely genderblind, too. And yet, 
there's such a weird stereotype out there that people believe that these these labels exist, and I don't know. It it, it upsets me and shocks me at the same time. Mm-hmm. And it, yeah, just it plays into so many. You know, if you look at like the negative connotations of words that are very cat-like, like when you call someone catty, it, you know, it's such a negative connotation. And so I think we see it play out in language as well. And it's just something that there are so many people out there I think who are working to um, redefine that label or to like go back and like try to own the label crazy cat lady. I mean, you can call me crazy cat lady if you want. I'm not going to deny it. But I think it's just people need to see that it's not something negative. I've had people tell me before, like, oh, I would get another cat, but people will think I'm a crazy cat lady. Or I'd get another cat, but, like, women think it's weird that a man has pet cats. And I'm like, who are these people? We need to reach these people. <laughs> you, you know, two of my good friends are the two crazy cat ladies out in Las Vegas, and they have a great product. I mean, literally the top product out there. And they are the coolest two. Jay and Adrian are just absolutely my favorite people out there. And if that's what a crazy cat person is, then sign me up. Because that <laughs> that is the perfect place that I'd want to be. I don't care what stereotype you want to label me at. If, that, if loving cats is going to put that label on me, I'm okay with it. That's cool. So, yeah, I'll own it. You and me both. <laughs> right? Well, is there anything we haven't covered that we should have? Um, not that I can think of. It's like this is, it would have been very thorough. I try. I really try. I want to make sure that we, we cover it to the best of the abilities and we're able to, you know, have a good conversation about it. So I do thank you for being on the podcast. It's, it has been a pleasure. And please come back anytime you want. All right, great. Thanks so much for having me. This was fun. I, I told you it would be. I told you it would be simple and fun. <laughs> well, I'm Chris Green. Exactly. <laughs> I'm Chris Green. Have a fantastic week. Bye-bye, everybody. Okay, gotta go in my bedtime. <laughs>